Okay, here we go. In, in this video, we're going to try as much as we can to wrap up the chapter on uh, the natural history of form. At least that's the title of the chapter, although he doesn't really get to that much till the end. Uh, and we'll get to it in this video, right? But the first part, we're really talking more about form in general, this concept of form uh, in art. Uh, for, for Dewey and what it means, right? And so we're going over some of these elements in the last video uh, that might not be so obvious, this notion of, uh, of, uh, of accumulation or uh, this cumulative effect, um, or you might call it um, fulfillment is a part of um, artistic form. Also, we briefly spoke about rarity and costliness and elegance and things like that. Uh, but also, we save that for this. We save this for this video. Technique, as well, is an aspect of form, and and this will get us into finally, really, the uh, sort of the advertised um, uh, subject of the chapter: the, the history of form, right? And really, it's more of a history of technique more than anything else, and that should get us to uh, the end of the chapter. Are pretty close to it. We might have to save a little bit for the next video, but we'll get through most of it. Um, uh, in this video. And then after that, I think the next chapter is talking more about um, uh, the, what it, what's called the organization of energies. It's kind of an interesting chapter. But, um, like, like the last couple videos, this one is purely optional. It's really for those that really want to dive deep into John Dewey. If you've already watched the first six or seven uh, videos, you could probably skip forward to the last one of the series and just sort of get the conclusion. Uh, otherwise, stick around. Let's look at uh, what he says about technique. Let's look at what he says about the history of form. Uh, I think it's a lot of interesting stuff. So let's start with this long quote here. Some of the traits mentioned, we talked about in the last video. So some of the traits mentioned are more often referred to technique than to form, right? We talked about skill. Uh, we talked about uh, costliness. That might be like the technique used. It's a rare technique or an expensive material. Um, the attribution is correct. So it's correct to say that when these qualities in question are referred to the artist rather than to his work. There is a technique that obtrudes, like the flourishes of a writing master. If skill and economy suggest their author, they take away from the work itself, right? So if, if you're reading the novel and you're just so, it's like so obvious that the person writing it is the person writing it. You're like, oh, this is so obviously a Corman uh, McCarthy novel, right? It's distracting, right? It suggests the author. And, and, and as he puts it, it takes away from the work itself. The traits of the work which suggest the skill of its producers are then in the work, but they are not of it. Technique is neither identical with form nor yet wholly independent of it. It is properly the skill with which the elements constituting form are managed. Otherwise, it's, a sh it's show off or a virtuosity separated from expression. So I'm imagining Dewey would not like this quote here. Uh, from Jay Maskus of Dinosaur Jr., right? Generally, my songs are just some riffs slung together as an excuse for a guitar solo, right? Yeah, yeah, Dewey would not approve of that approach, I think, right? The guitar solo, as wonderful, it might be the most you know, amazing part of the piece of music, but it still has to complement, it has to have this cohesion with the other parts. Uh, you know, that's an essential element to the aesthetic experience and aesthetic form uh, for Dewey. So, uh, so here we finally get into uh, the history part, right? The history of form, the, what he calls the natural history of form. We're starting to finally segue into that part of the chapter. He writes, significant advances in technique occur, therefore, in connection with efforts to solve problems that are not technical but that grow out of the need for new modes of expression. So we don't use new technological advances just because they're there, you know, just because, oh, wow, cool, I can do it, I'm going to. But he's arguing that we might use a new um, instrument, a new type of paint, uh, a new uh, type of canvas or whatever, material, because it is 
something we have to use to express what we want to express. You might think of like electronic music. Um, I'm a big fan of the early industrial music. Most people aren't familiar with that genre. Or if they are, they, 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 they probably think of someone like, um, you know, Nine Inch Nails or Ministry, but not the early, you know, uh, vintage industrial from the late 1970s. But you could argue that that music, if you're familiar with the industrial music of the early uh, 1980s, the late 1970s, uh, the, the music was, was made with this equipment that was built from, you know, pretty crude electronics that they bought at stores. It was just sort of a, uh, what's what they had on hand, really. It was sort of uh, necessary. It was, uh, they were working with the materials that were, were available to express the uh, the emotions that they had and i'm kind of digressing here because i'm really <clears throat> i'm really interested in that scene so i don't want to get too much into it let's stick with what dewey uh what dewey says here right he doesn't talk about music uh that much uh really uh, throughout the whole book um he alludes to music quite a bit when he talks about the the way that, that art springs from nature and from natural uh, intercourse with the environment um, but he, he tends to, in his examples, he tends to, to, to focus a lot on painting. Um, so maybe I shouldn't use that example of industrial music. Uh, I should stick with sort of the visual realm. But anyway, let's, let's go with what he says here. So he says that, again, um, advances in technique occur in connection with efforts to solve problems. Then they're not technical problems, but they grow out of a need for new modes of experience, right? A new, a new way of life, a new thing occurs, and artists have to have a way to express it, right? That just, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, is appropriate for, um, for that experience. This statement is as true of aesthetic arts as of the technical. There are improvements in technique that have to do merely with the bettering of an old style vehicle, but they're insignificant in comparison with the change in technique from the wagon to the automobile. When social needs called for a rapid transportation under personal control, it was not possible even with the railway locomotive. If we take developments in the major techniques of painting during and since the Renaissance, we find that they were connected with efforts to solve problems that grew out of the experience expressed in painting and not out, not out of the craftsmanship of painting itself. Right. So again, the artist had something they wanted to say, and in order to do it, in order to say it, it had to, the uh, new techniques had to be developed. This is much different than, you know, having a new model of an automobile coming out every year with a couple bells and whistles and new gadgets, maybe a little bit more horsepower. It's a little different. It's, it's quite different uh, than going from a wagon to an automobile. Okay. There's a big leap from using electronic instruments, electrical guitars, and acoustical guitars. The, the, the blues musicians had to sort of uh, harness this new, you know, people like B.B. Uh, King and Muddy Waters and some of the first uh, musicians to ever use electrical guitars, right? They, 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 they had a sort of uh, visceral power that they wanted to express, and the electrical uh, uh, guitar gave them that sort of vibrancy and that emotion that was able to sort of uh, bring to their audience that power of expression, right? Um, so here's David Lee Roth, right? He's actually, I guess they, they, this quote here kind of comes back to save uh, Jay Maskus, right? When Jay Maskus says that he writes all his, his, his songs just so he can play his guitar solo. Uh, but then David Lee Roth says the most important part of a rock song is the guitar solo. So, uh, you know, maybe if that's the case, then it's okay to be uh, show offy if the, uh, the, uh, uh, if it's part of the form of rock, right? If rock and roll has developed into this art form where the guitar, the lead guitar is kind of the showcase, then perhaps the guitar uh, uh, solo should be prominent. Right. That's that's appropriate to form. I don't know if that's an argument against Dewey or not. I don't know if he would allow that. Right? He seems to be, at least in those previous quotes that we just looked at, he seems to be pretty um, a hard line about this. Right. That in, in an artistic piece, there really shouldn't be any elements that distract you from the other elements. They should all complement. 
that's not to say that there are some scenes in the movie that are more exciting and more striking than other scenes, but they can't be so striking that that's the only thing you ever think about. And that's the only thing they have to be a part of the whole that the fit as a part of the whole and complement it. Right. Um, so I'm not really sure if this really will save this quote from David Lee Roth will save Jay Maskus from Dewey or not. I'll leave that open for you guys to, uh, to think over, but again, um, he says that technique, the dependence of significant technique upon the need for expressing certain distinctive modes of experience, he says this is testified by the three stages that usually attend the appearance of a new technique. Okay, so he thinks he's right about this. He thinks that, you know, technique it develops not because just because they can do it right people don't come up with a new way of painting just for the heck of it they do it as 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 a um, response to a need to express something and the only way they can express it is through this new technique so he's going to give us a few examples he says that this happens in a sort of a three stage uh process right in which uh a new technique appears okay so we're, what's the the first stage at first, there is experimentation on the side of artists with considerable exaggeration of the factor to which the new technique is adapted. This was true of the use of line to define recognition of the value of the round, as with Mantegna. Now, so Mantegna, I, I couldn't really find any of any paintings uh, online that that had this quality he's talking about. I found this one here. This is one of his most famous works, The Lamentation Over the Dead Christ. This is where there's a lot of line work and a lot of roundness over, over, the, over the, the figure of Christ here laying down. If you look at the, the folds of the cloth, but there's not a, a lot of, well, maybe you could say the shadows and the light. Look at the darkness on the left working its way over to the right. Um, so for Dewey, this is a new form of expressiveness, these sort of stark, um, jagged lines, very rigid, very defined, not as smooth and as elegant perhaps as previous painters. Okay. He also talks about the impressionist. He says it's true of the typical impressionist in respect to light effects. So this, in the first stage, you know, when, 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 when a new technique or a new style is introduced, in, uh, on the side of the public, he says, there's a general condemnation of the intent and subject matter of these adventures in art. So in other words, it's not usually accepted, right? The Impressionist, for instance, right here we have a, in the next slide a <clears throat> famous piece by Renoir. Um, you know, the Impressionists were, 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 uh, were laughed at, right? Um, they, you know, when they first were presenting their, their pieces, they had to do it independently of the established art galleries people f saw these works as like unfinished. They were blurry, you know, you hadn't, you hadn't added all the definition and tone, but it was impressionistic, right? That was the point they were trying to get across. It was much more personal. It was sort of like a, a, a kind of a dreamlike uh, sort of Im impression. Again, that's the, the name of the movement. Uh, originally that term impressionistic was supposed to be derogatory. The first critic who used it was like, it's just an impression, you know, it's like, it doesn't give you that full umph, right? Uh, but that was the, that's exactly what they were going for. And so they had this, this thing they wanted to, uh, this effect, the painters, the expression, impressionist painters, there was a, an effect that they were trying to invoke in the viewer. And the only way they could do it was through this technique. So in the next stage, right, the first stage, the public kind of shrinks away from this, doesn't like it. But in the next stage, the fruits of the new procedure are absorbed. They are naturalized and affect certain modifications of the old tradition. This period establishes the new aims and hence the new technique as having classic validity, right? So now this technique that was once scoffed at is made a part of the tradition. It's accepted as a part of something valid, right? And it's a company with the prestige that holds over into subsequent periods, right? So now we look at impressionist paintings today and we don't see anything that radical about them, right? They seem actually kind of normal and mundane compared to some other works we see now in you know, contemporary uh, art museums. 
So what's the third stage, right? The first stage is when the art technique is sort of, you know, too, too, too weird, too wacky. It's not accepted. The second stage is when the technique becomes accepted and becomes, um, you know, sort of integrated into uh, the classic, you know, what's considered sort of classic and, 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 and uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, you know, becomes almost conventional. The final stage, the third stage, he says, there's a period when special features of the technique of the masters uh, of the balanced period are adopted for imitation and made them, uh, are, are, they're made ends in themselves. So in other words, the techniques are used just because they're cool, not because uh, to get some sort of effect, okay? Again, the impressionists were painting the way they were doing it, not to sort of show off or be like, hey, look at this cool new technique that I have, but they were trying to evoke a certain response, a certain aesthetic response. Thus, and so during this third stage, um, this is sort of the show-offy stage. This is where we just use the technique just to show it, not for any sort of relevant purpose uh, that's really appropriate to the piece. Um, and again, the, the techniques are made ends in themselves. And he gives the example of uh, the later 17th century, right? And I'm not a big fan of this period myself, so I'm, maybe I'm kind of on board with him. I mean, I've seen some work from Titian and uh, Tintoretto that, that are pretty impressive. They're, they're amazing painters. I don't want to discredit their, their skill. Uh, but he's, you know, this, this picture here that I, that I picked is pretty gruesome, right? Salome with the head of John the Baptist, but it's a, it's a good demonstration, I think, of what he's, um, what he's alluding to here in the quote. Let's read the quote and then I'll explain, uh, what I mean here in, in the painting. So again, this is the third period. Well, let me back up. The third period when a, the special features of the technique, right? The, the new technique, the impressionistic technique, well, these special features of technique are adopted for imitation and they're made ends in themselves. Thus, in the late 17th century, the treatment of dramatic movement, characteristic of Titian or still more of Tintoretto, means chiefly, or sorry, by means chiefly of light and shade, is exaggerated to the point of the theatrical. In this third stage, which dogs creative work, after the latter has re received general recognition, technique is borrowed without relation to the urgent experience that at first in evoked it, the academic and eclectic result, right? So it becomes an academic exercise. It becomes something you wanna just use to show off I know this artistic technique because I went to art school, right? The, the academic and the eclectic result. So how does this picture of uh, John the Baptist or Salome with the head of John the Baptist demonstrate what he's talking about here, right? So this is Titian, right? So I picked one of the painters <clears throat> who he mentions here. And again, I couldn't really find what he was talking about as far as the use of lines to um, evoke light. Uh, but there's a similarity here. So if we back up to this picture of uh, Mantegna, which he admires, right? He admires the work of Mantegna. Uh, you, know, you see the work of lines here over the legs of the Christ figure, okay? And the way that they're rounded about, it, it does provide a, a striking aesthetic effect, right? This depth, um, you know, the, the sheet as it's draped over the Christ figure, right? The way the lines work is very effective, okay? You have the same technique that's used here in Titian, right? Here, if you look at the, um, the uh, I guess you call it a scarf, not really a scarf, but a sash or whatever, this uh, cloth that's hanging over her arm, this white cloth, Similarly, we've got a stark use of lines, okay, and folds and all this that you get in the painting of Mantegna. But here, it really doesn't serve any sort of function. It's just kind of thrown in there as a show-offy technique. You know, look, I can draw these jagged lines with this sort of, you know, uh, with all this shading just like Mantegna does. But it's borrowing from him in order to sort of show off the technique that's not relevant and intrinsic to the uh, subject matter of the work. Uh, and that's trying to be expressed. So what to us is a charming naivete was to them, 
the simple and direct method of expressing a felt subject matter. For this reason, while there is not continuity or repetition in any aesthetic art, neither is there of necessity advance. And this is a pretty controversial claim that he's making, but let me continue. I'll read the quote and then I'll, I'll comment here. Greek sculpture will never be equaled in its own terms. The modern reproduction of architecture of the Gothic cathedral always lacks the quality of the original. What happens in the movement of art is emergence of new materials of experience demanding expression and therefore involving in their expression new forms and techniques. Manet went back in time to achieve his brushwork, but his return involved no mere copying of an old technique. Right? So I've got a Manet um, painting uh, here on the left. But what is he saying in this quote? He's adding a little bit. Uh, he's not just he's not just repeating what he said before, right? I mean, um, obviously, again, um, you know, for him, techniques develop as a need to express something new, okay? And they are culturally embedded in a situation, a lived situation. So when we talk about, um, you know, things like classical music, I I, I really sadly um, acknowledge this because I'm a I'm a big fan of classical music, but it doesn't have the appeal that it, it once did, right? It used to draw a lot more crowds, even works like uh, Michelangelo's David, apparently when it was unveiled originally, all the people in the town of Florence were just, you know, they were all circled around it, waiting for it to be unveiled and cheering. You don't see people lining up to see sculptures unveiled at museums anymore, right? They're going to see the world premiere of some movie or, you know, the world, you know, they want to, they want to download the album on, on the streaming service the day it comes out. Even that's becoming a thing of the past. Okay, but what Dewey's saying here is that certain art forms, it's not that there's an advance, it's not that like um, opera is an advance over Greek tragedy. When we're, when we're looking at these works of art, we have to judge them in their own context, right? We have to judge them as products of their own time. In a sense, this is much like what I think Nietzsche is trying to say in his Birth of Tragedy, another parallel I'm drawing between uh, Dewey and uh, Nietzsche, which I don't think Dewey would appreciate, but nevertheless, it's there, right? You can't separate the art, the technique, um, you know, the expression from the context in which it was wrought. So that's another point he, he repeats again and again, but here um, having to do with technique, right? The Gothic cathedral, it's always going to have more effect than like a modern replication of it, right? Because it was built in that time because that was the material, that was, that was the aesthetic, that was sort of an expression of the culture, right? We were talking in earlier videos about how certain cities have a certain character, a certain aesthetic to them. The Gothic cathedral had a certain aesthetic that fit the time period. If you create it now, it's just a, it's a replica of that. It doesn't quite uh, achieve the same effect. It doesn't work the same way, I think Dewey would argue, as it did back when it was actually constructed. The relativity of technique to instruments is often overlooked. It becomes important when the new instrument is a sign of change in culture, that is, in material to be expressed. Early pottery is largely determined by the potter's wheel. Rugs and blankets owe much of their geometric design to the nature of the instrument of weaving. Such things by themselves are like the physical constitution of an artist, as Cezanne wished he had Manet's muscles, right? So the material that we're talking about, that we're dealing with, the technique, can be as, you know, it can be the obvious, what we're thinking of as the, I don't know, the way that you use your brush, right? The, the brush stroke, uh, the amount of paint that you use, the type of paint that you use. But it can also be your own physique. Cezanne is a different painter than Manet because Manet had bigger muscles, right? His brush strokes are going to be uh, different. That, that's going to come out in the canvas. Similarly, different artistic styles, different art forms are a product of their time. We can't use one time period, uh, some standard of work of art from that time period, and necessarily apply it to other time periods. Like I'm talking about classical music. I'm a big fan of it. 
But to say that hip hop is not as good as classical music, you know, Dewey, I think, would push back on that. I'm not sure if Dewey would be a big uh, fan of hip hop music, but hip hop music has a certain thing it needs to express. It's an urban type of music, right? It's a music developed out of a certain culture and it had it has a certain thing it wanted to express. I'm not saying all hip hop music is the same, but there's an aesthetic about hip hop. There's a certain sort of style about hip hop that's completely far removed from a classical type of aesthetic. And if you're gonna express a certain type of impulse or emotion, perhaps hip hop music and the type of instruments, you know, the DJ, uh, you know, the, the, the mixer, the, the drum machine, these are the materials, these are the medium that you're gonna have to use to express yourself in that way. Whereas classical music is not gonna do the same thing. It has its own place and its own uh, effectiveness at, at, at evoking certain emotions, but maybe not for certain time periods and certain cultures and certain uh, uh, people. Right, so this is all that he's saying. Artists are always experimenting too, and so this is why we're always gonna have the development of technique because they have this, this, this urge to express and they, they have to go through this medium in order to release this, uh, this discharge of expression. <clears throat> There's always this, this, this urge to experiment. So for, for Dewey, one of the essential traits of the artist is that he is born an experimenter. Without this trait, he becomes a poor or a good academic. I hate that. He's a poor or good academic. That word, academic. I can't even say it. Academic, academician, academician. I don't even know. That, that stupid, archaic word. Let me start the quote over. So one of the essential traits of the artist is that he's born an experimenter. Without this trait, he becomes a poor or a good academic. Okay, so he's just an artist who went to art school, learned the technique, knows how to apply it. He's not really an artist in Dewey's sense. He's not expressing anything. He's just going through some mechanical motions. He's reproducing an already tried and true and tested technique. The artist, however, is compelled to be an experimenter because he has to express an intensely individualized experience through means and materials that belong to the common and public world. This problem cannot be solved once for all. It is met in every new work undertaken. Otherwise, an artist repeats himself and becomes aesthetically dead. Only because the artist operates experimentally does he open new fields of experience and disclose new aspects and qualities in familiar scenes and objects. Right, so technique, artistic medium, all of these things are the instruments through which the artist is able to express this individualized experience as, 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 a, as Dewey puts it, this intensely individualized experience. And that's why he has to be an experimenter. He has to keep trying new things because every experience is new. And so there have to be new ways of, of coming up with this object. Otherwise, he's just, he finds a, a, a formula and he or she, the artist, just keeps repeating that formula over and over again. That's not expression for Dewey. That's not expression proper. That's just mechanical um, repetition, reproduction, and that's not art. That's not expression for uh, John Dewey. Rhythm. Okay, now rhythm has a important place, an important role in what Dewey calls form. Uh, I'm gonna read this quote here and we're gonna end the video on this. Uh, we're still not quite done with the chapter on the natural history of form. We're almost there. But this next quote is quite a doozy as you can see. So I'm gonna leave it for the next video. We're gonna wrap up this chapter in the next video. But let's get started here. Let's talk about rhythm, right? This is quite a, um, a you might say a, a, a vague introduction uh, to the notion of rhythm, but in this next long quote, which I will save for the next lecture, he gives us a few examples to try to drive it home and make it a little bit less obscure, okay? But what does rhythm have to do with form, and how is rhythm a characteristic of experience in general? Remember, for him, 
art is always just a sort of refined, intensified experience. So the first characteristic, he says, of the environing world that makes possible the existence of artistic form is rhythm. You might think about what he says about strife. There's always this sort of receding and contraction and you know, obstacles and resistance and you know, smooth channels and rough channels. That's just the nature of being a living being. So you might think of that when you hear him talk about um, existence having this rhythm to it. So there's there is rhythm in nature before poetry, painting, architecture, and music exist. Were it not so, rhythm as an essential property of form would be merely superimposed upon material, not an operation through which material affects its own culmination in experience. So again, um, because rhythm is this sort of natural part of experience, it's an inevitable part, an, an inevitable part of the live creature, the living organisms encounter with the world. There's this rhythm and flow to things. There's this tension and release to all struggle, to all life. If there wasn't that, he doesn't think there'd be art. And if you don't know why, you know, it doesn't make sense to you, you have to go back to one of the earlier videos where we talked about this, right? For Dewey, aesthetic experience, the aesthetic is always an overcoming of some obstacle and, and the sort of uh, the, the accumulation of these preceding stages that are, are uh, discharged in some sort of aesthetic moment of unity and equilibrium, et cetera, okay? So for him, that, that's always going to be an essential part of the aesthetic. So rhythm and flow and change and nature are the basis really for art and therefore, he says, are going to always be intrinsic to form. They're not superimposed on it. Rhythm's not something you just add for fun. It's something that really makes up the aesthetic product, the aesthetic work of art. You have to have rhythm. There has to be a certain flow. Even when we're talking about visual images, there has to be a certain rhythm to all the elements of the work of art. Well, I've gone further and I've said more than I really intended to in this video. I see we're going way over for time. So I'll go ahead and stop it there. We're gonna move on to the next chapter in the next video. We're gonna talk about what he calls the organization of energies, right? He sees art, artistic expression, and art itself as a sort of organization of energies. It's a great chapter, fun chapter. Again, an optional chapter. You can skip over it if you want to and go to the, the, the last video, the concluding video. <clears throat> but I suggest you stick around because I think Dewey has some interesting things to say more about form. We're going to wrap up this chapter a bit uh, and then moving on to the next chapter we we'll talk about the organization of energies. All right. So thanks again. And I hope to see you on the other side. Cheers.